Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with uh, Disney's famous Ike Eisenman. And uh, we are <laughs> pleased today. We have uh, a guest from one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time. I, I grew up watching this show from Family Affair, also the uh, author of several books, including Surviving Sissy, My Family Affair in Hollywood. Please help us welcome to Pop Culture Retro, Kathy Garver. Kathy, thank you for joining us. You bet. Hello there. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to start with, I was going over your IMDb page and was astounded by how many credits you have. Uh, many of them I was familiar with. There were some that I had been a fan of the show, but had no idea that you were in them. And like, you know, I, I will get to those. But you started, I'd like to ask, you started so young and had guest spots in some of the major sitcoms of the time, like Our Miss Brooks, Private Secretary, My Favorite Husband. How did you first get started into getting into acting to begin with? I'll tell you, but what I forgot to do is say, Alexa, off. <laughs> She's playing Yairuma, which I thought <laughs> Okay. Now, oh, wait, that's, not that's a, a musical <laughs> background. <laughs> that's a first for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. There may be many more. I, <laughs> I first started at the Medlin Kitties, and that is where Shirley Temple was discovered at the Medlin Studios. So I was tap dancing when I was three years old, and my mom, like most moms in Hollywood, thought that their little girl, I had curly hair at the time, I didn't know what happened, <laughs> um, would be the next Shirley Temple. That didn't quite work out. I became the next Kathy Barber, but <laughs> I uh, got a lot of experience in learning how to I sing and dance, and I didn't really start professionally until I went on uh, an interview that my aunt had set up. They were doing the motion picture, The Night of the Hunter. Have either of you seen that movie? I was going to ask you about that one, too. Yes. <laughs> and that's how I got started, really. That was my first professional gig, and uh, it was really an experience. And, Charles Lawton directed that film. It was the first and last, unfortunately, uh, fil uh, film that he ever directed, starring Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters and Lillian Gish and Peter Graves. And Billy Chapman was a little boy. And they had a little girl. And she was just six. And she had no experience. And she couldn't really do a little uh, everything. And here I was with all my Megalyn Kitty experience and I was eight and little for my age. So I was her double throughout the entire movie and did wow. most of her scenes. Any of the running scenes, any of the scenes on the water, any of the stuffing money into the doll. Oops, I don't want that to be a spoiler, but <laughs> that, was, uh, that was my first job. Oh, that's incredible. I, I, and how was that experience like just being on that set with like, you know, some of these heavyweights, you know, well, it was fabulous. And I hadn't, as I said, been on a film set before. And the first scene that I did is when Robert Mitchum, who plays this crazed, um, uh, not a priest, but plays preacher. Uh, he had, do you remember he had L-O-V-E and A-T-E right, yes. -E that was tattooed on his uh, on his hands and love, right. and hate <laughs> fights with love, but love wins as he's killing Shelly Winters. But anyway, we're hiding in the basement. I'm supposed to be hiding in the basement with Billy Chapin, who's playing the little boy. And he comes crashing down these steps and he crashes all the, the shelves that have these bottles on him and there are cobwebs all over. And I said, this is showbiz? <laughs> because for a little girl, you know, and there's all this chaos going on around me. And I said, oh, gee, I could really be afraid of this fellow coming down to get us. And, but the, the smells and the sounds, and there's my gardener. Speak, speaking of sounds, is that another first? 
<laughs> no, it's it's yeah. A gardener's a first. We've had a helicopter, right. and of course, we have our smattering of of, of dogs that like to uh, chime <laughs> in. So. <laughs> Well, my dog's going to get to the side, so he may. Two first. There's, there's the gardener. <laughs> there you go. I never know what time he's going to be here. Sometimes he comes at 10, sometimes he comes at 2, sometimes he comes down. <laughs> well, Welcome. <laughs> well, well, speaking of iconic films, I mean, you were in The Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, one of my favorite. I watch it every year, once a year. Can you tell us a little about that experience and working with Cecil B. DeMille, Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner? I mean, my God, really. And you were so young to win that one. Yes, well, my God, you you really said the magical word. I went from <laughs> horror to, you know, beautiful, epic, wonderful, godly film. And so I don't think anything could have been a bigger contrast from Night of the Hunter and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and I was first just... Uh, I was uh, as I was first cast as an extra, and I ha didn't know what that was. I by that time, I had an uh, an agent, Hazel McMillan, who was a very popular children's agent at the time. So uh, I got the job as an extra, and I'm in the first scene, and we are leaving town, so to speak. I went to wardrobe and got all these very uh, these woven robes that were very scratchy and had on dark makeup. And I had dark hair at that time. My, my whole career <laughs> depends on my hair. But that time I had dark hair. And so I'm in this wagon and then we are going out of town. Um, the, I was a slave girl, Rachel. Well, I was a slave <laughs> going. And uh, on this web, and all of a sudden, I hear this great big voice say, "Don't let that little girl's face get in the camera." Who's that? Is that God? We were, you know, shooting the, the Ten Commandments, and I was a little girl. Didn't or didn't turn out to be God. It was Cecil B. DeMille, and he was on this great big crane. So he was like a cinematic deity, and he's looking down. And I said, "Oh." So the associate producer director came over and put like a little blanket. So I'm just peeking out so you really couldn't tell who I was. After that scene was over, I got off the wagon. He got off the crane. We met, we chatted. And then he had special scenes written into the movie for me with Charlton Heston and who rescues me off of the mountain. So that's, um, that's my, I have lots of stories about Ten Commandments, but that is how I got to be in that particular movie. Well, I'd like to hear, I was going to ask you a little bit about what, what some of your experiences were, some of your memories working on that film were. Well, you know, again, as a child, what you primarily, at least this child, you know, you sense and you smell like the, the first day on Unnighted the Hunter, I'm smelling all of the fumes from the faux website, the web, uh, webs that they spider webs that they had hmm. and then on the ten commandments there were the donkeys and the oxen and, and all of that and the, being scratched on the paper mache mountain but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cecil B. DeMille because he made these great big epics and sometimes they can be kind of off-putting like today they don't really see the story of course, Ten Commandments is based on one of the best stories. I mean, the Bible was, you know, not a bad story. It's still around. <laughs> uh, so he had pretty good material to work with. But because he had these great big epics, he thought that he would lose the relatability and the people be looking at the, you know, the Spartans. So as was his want, he would pick somebody out of, of the crowd and he would write um, scenes into it the movie to make the the film more hospitable, more emotional, and again more relatable. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the people that that he had picked out and wrote scenes for. So here's here's the deal. Well, the, the first thing that I'm in, I'm looking for my little doll Rebecca. I found Rebecca and and then we are in the edge of this. Then it's time for the whole Red Sea to close. And we were shooting that at Paramount. And they had these catwalks set up all around the top. And they had this paper mache mountain. And my direction was to, when he 
calls out to Sasha Lee DeMille, I climb up the paper mache mountain into the arms of Nina Foch, who is another one of the slaves. And this had taken like three days to set up. They had tons and tons of extras and, and donkeys and, and oxen and camels, oh my. And they were all going out. And on the uh, catwalk were these great big vats of water. And when action came, all the water's supposed to come in to simulate the Red Sea closing. So, so we, we were all set. Now, this was another one of Cecil B. DeMille's traits as a fabulous director. And he, before they had television series with three cameras, he set up three cameras all at once because this was, took a long time to do. So we had one camera that was getting the main shot, the master, and then he had another camera that was getting another a look at the scene. But just to be sure, he put a camera way up on the catwalk with the water so he could get an overhead shot and we could get the scene. All right, all of that comes to fruition. We're all set to go. Everybody knows what's going on. This is action. And I climb up the mountain to Nina and all the, the animals go through and all the water comes down. And he says, ah, that was great. And he says, camera number one, how was it for you? Cameron then said, oh, Mr. Tamil, I, I am so sorry, but water splashed on the legs and we lost the, we lost the uh, shot. You lost the shot? I, I am so sorry. But then, of course, he had the second camera man. So camera number two, how was it for you? Mr. DeMille, I am so sorry, but a, a camel walked in front of, of the camera and then this, I, I didn't get the shot. I get the shot. Well, you can imagine that Mr. DeMille wasn't really crazy about the way that this was going. And, he's, and after all that time and all that money, you remember that he had that cameraman way back up on the catwalk. So he says, camera number three, how was it for you? And the cameraman says, ready when you are, CB. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a true story because I was there. Wow. Wow. <laughs> All right. Now that's a legendary story. I it's have heard best, people yes. tell that. I had no idea it was a true story. I I I just thought it was some some you know um, you want to call it an urban myth, but that's fan that's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> it's a real true story. They even wrote, I think, a, a play about it. Ready when you are, CB. Yeah, I think so too. That sounds familiar. Okay, are we, anybody paying attention here? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wow. incredible. That's incredible. Uh, I, I you started transitioning it. You know, you've started doing a lot of TV shows. I read, you know, you appeared with Bing Crosby, Milton Berle, real Hollywood royalty. I mean, uh, what was it like working with them as well? Well, as a child, I, I wasn't yeah. aware of their status. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was just saying, I was there focused, doing my part, you know, trying to figure out where, where I should stand and to whom I was speaking. And I hadn't mm -hmm. heard of a lot of these people because I was in school and I did my work and then I, I did my homework and went to bed and didn't watch a lot of TV. So a lot of them I just discovered by actually being on the show. Oh, incredible. But Bing Crosby, I, I, uh, when I was a teenager, he had another show, the, the Bing Crosby show. And I, I remembered that then I could really say, wow, I'm really Bing Crosby. And <laughs> he was so delightful. And I lived once upon a time, well, for 38 years, in a town called Hillsboro, which is up in Northern California before I moved to LA. And the Crosby's had a house there. And so that's where Bing Crosby was and his wife Mary, Mary after the, the second, third wife, Mary. And so I, I knew them from that even more than just being there. Uh, let's go into, uh, you know, your, your fam most famous role, I guess, Family Affair. How did you get cast on, uh, on that show? And, you know, I, I thought, you know, Brian Keith was amazing. The whole cast was great. You know, you, Brian Keith, Sebastian Cabot, and Johnny Whitaker, Anissa Jones. So, you know, tell us a little bit how you got cast in that and what was it like working on that show? Well, I had been working for a while. And then at the time I was going to UCLA 
I had moved to San Bernardino for a couple of years. And so I would go in occasionally on uh, interviews to LA. San Bernardino, if some of your listeners don't know, is just about an hour from LA. So um, I was actually in my third year at UCLA and I, at, I was a Pi Phi. So my agent, I still had the same agent I had had, Hazel McMillan, she says, okay. Um, my mother called me actually, and she says, Hazel called, we've got an interview over uh, at Desi Wu, and it's for a series that's already been shot, and they have the cast except for the teenage girl, and they want to see you this afternoon, and they're already shooting the pilot. I said, well, well, oh, okay, okay. She said, here's the thing though. They want somebody who is, is 18 and has blonde hair. I didn't have blonde hair then. Um, <laughs> and preferably with blue eyes, but you know, I have brown eyes and they didn't have uh, those uh, things to change your eye color then. So she says, they want a blonde and I have dark hair. And she said, my mom, I'll come over to the sorority because I have this stuff, streaks and tips. What's that mom? Streaks and tips, this is great. I'll, I'll put this on your hair to make sure they're instantly blonde. I said, okay, mom. And so all the sorority sisters were gathered around and I went to my sorority sister, Tootie Spottenberg, who later married Gregory Peck, the son. So anyway, Tootie was the blondest blonde I knew. So I said, Tootie, do you have any like light brown eyebrows? And so something like that. So she dug in and got me some some nice blonde makeup. My mom comes over, she sprays my hair. We gotta go, we gotta go. We have to get in LA traffic. So we're going there. I look at my hair and I said, mom, are you kidding me? I mean, I look like something out of Goldfinger. This was all bronze, you know, hard like a helmet. I know you gentlemen have probably never experienced that. <laughs> it, was, it was quite an experience for, for, my, for my hair. So we get there and I'm talking nicely to Ed Hartman, who was a writer, creator, producer. And we are, we're chatting and having a nice time, I thought. Then he looked at my hair and he said, what's wrong with your hair? I said, my hair? And uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the sunshine. He said, yes, it's turning green. Green, <laughs> what is it that funny? <laughs> it's the light, it's the light around. Well. So that broke the ice. We started chatting. And so we said, okay. Um, then they looked at um, some footage that I had done. I had done uh, Death Valley Days where I was 18 playing a 12 year old. And here yeah. I was 20 trying to be an 18 year old. But again, I'm, li I'm little, I'm just five foot one. Five foot one. Five foot one. <laughs> and so I, it, I could always play it. I'm still on the thing. Um, so I, they looked at the footage from Death Valley Days. I went and they sent me to Max Factor, which is still there. It's the Hollywood Museum. I have a thing about the Hollywood Museum. And I got this long, we're talking about hair again, this long a wig that was quite long, long wig, something out of Alice in Wonderland, this blue and white check dress. I said, so what are they making? So I wore this dress and, and this long wig. And so the next day, because they were shooting the pilot, I get a call at the sorority and it, it was Hazel, my agent, she says, well, they, they loved you. They, they want to cast you. And, and all the sorority girls around me, yay, yay, yay. And then the, they said, there's a caveat. And I says, what? They said, never wear that dress again. Never wear that wig again. He said, <laughs> you got it. And so that's how that happened. Well, I, I had read that, you know, Brian Keith was only like available. He made like a very strict shooting schedule. So he was only available to shoot. What was that like that, you know, you could only shoot certain scenes? Was it like hectic because of that, like rushed or no? Well, it was very strange. Don Featherson, who was the producer of My Three Sons, who was still, which was still going on, at the same time as Family Affair got this Federson method, now it's, it's called. At that time, it, it is de rigueur for a movie star to, to do a television show, star on that little tiny black box. 
Um, and at that time in black and white, ours was one of the first in color. And that's why I love mm. your banner because we, we had the kaleidoscope with all the colors just to remind people if they didn't notice that <laughs> our show was in color. So Don <laughs> Featherson found a lure for all these movie stars, to, not all the movie stars, but for a movie star to come and do a television show. And it was the same lure that he gave to Brian Keith to do Family Affair that he was producing that he gave to Fred McMurray for My Three Sons, which is you only have to work like 60 days and then all the other time you can do as many movies as you want. And the other biggest part is that they got a financial percentage of the show. Now that had really not been done. But both, both agents of Fred and Brian thought, well, this is just good. This is a very good deal. <laughs> and, and it was a good deal for, for both of them. Now, what did that do to the cast? Well, we would be shooting like four different scenes from four different shows in wow. one day. All the scenes that Brian were, was in that we would shoot first and then he'd leave and then we'd pick up wow. all the other scenes. So obviously mm. all thir at that time, 33, 32 scripts had to be finished at the time. And then we would go from there. So it, it was interesting to say the least. Oh my, <laughs> and uh, your favorite episode? The Waltz from Vienna. I, I love that. I was Austrian and um, it, it was fun for me because I got to dress up and it was very romantic and um, a prince asked me to marry him and stupid sissy said no. You do not know what's wrong with that girl. I would have said yes, it's Kathy, but no, she was she was in love with love, not with them. Oh, please. Anyway. And I read that you you were you remained close with Brian Keith up until uh, his death. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was he was a very interesting man and uh, and a friend. And when he, when he died, um, I had a group of people and we put together a fund and we got him a star on the Walk of Stars. Oh, nice. A posthumous star, which sometimes is very difficult to support publicity. He did not like to be in front of the camera. He, he, was, he was a Marine, he was really down to earth. He only liked the work. He loved the work and he liked the money and he loved his family, but he didn't like all the coupla and all that. Actually, in a speech I gave at his star, I said, well, if Brian was looking down at us from heaven, I know. He says, what's all this coupla about? <laughs> it's okay. He, he was great. That's great. I, I'm going to transition over to, uh, like Ike, you were, did a lot of voiceover work, including one of my favorites as a kid, you know, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. <laughs> so uh, what was that like to be like, you know, working in, uh, you know, voiceover things? And also you were in another game that I liked, the Gabriel Knight one, which I had no idea <laughs> as well. Yes. And, you know, I thought that I have, I usually have um, one of the toys. Yeah. <laughs> Is this another first that people get up out of their chair and walk away from you? No, oh, we've no. had that as well. Oh, okay, no, good. Yeah. At and, least you came. At least you came back. <laughs> <laughs> at least I have my pants on. <laughs> um, this has been a, a really a good show. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. I loved it, and I love Stan Lee. And this year, they just brought out a character, uh, a six-inch. Um, character oh, five, of, wow. of, you know of action figure of my of my character is what I'm trying to say an what? action figure of my character and there's Ms. Lyon the only thing is that her head's detachable so I'm not really crazy that someone's decapitating <laughs> but anyway oh, wow. these have been <laughs> these are very popular that's fire fire star and then Jonathan Jones but primarily fire star I love that show. I, I watched that all the time as a kid. What, is, what was the difference for you? I mean, like, you know, and I could, you know, ask this too about working with voiceover as opposed to like, you know, doing in front of the camera, I guess. 
Well, you can do the interviews in pajamas, as I probably know, or, or other things. Yeah, we, we love that. We love that part where we don't necessarily have to, well, the, I didn't have to shave or like dress appropriately. I could just go in. And of course, a lot of us, <laughs> I think a lot of that group is a little less best dressed for our gigs because of that luxury. But yeah, I get that totally. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's fun. So And it's a whole different dynamic. I had actually... Uh, graduated from UCLA with a degree in speech. So I, and then I've done a lot of over 80 audio books, but uh, because of that, and then I went back to get a master's in theater arts, you know, putting those things together. But still at the same time, my, my favorite is to probably doing movies. I like to, uh, I, because voiceovers are very, it's quick, it's quick. And so they're, they're fun. And I like, especially, I, I don't know if you did this, if you're, you know, like when you get the script and you do like the uh, read beforehand with everybody and then, you know, record, you know, if there are enough mics with everybody, or did you do it just one at a time? I did it. I did it as a group on, on all the projects I did. And then the industry changed. I don't, I don't know if that was, if it was common practice at the time. Um, and to explain to people, a lot of animation is done where you just go in and record your character's lines. That's it. You're not working, working off of anyone else. You're just at a booth by yourself and the director's working with you, which, which it's kind of interesting. Cause I, I did one show, um, my one series called the ring Raiders that, that unfortunately is like one of those Hollywood things got canceled before we were finished, like recording all the episodes. It, it barely even made it on the air and it was a group, um, uh, a group recording, but I, my experience with it was that the, the director would have us go through the whole script. Then we'd start back at the beginning. Then he'd hit, he would pound every single line. And so every actor then was doing like 10, 20, takes of their line oh and then we just move all the way down and it was really challenging and really exhausting because it was kind of weird trying to at times figure out what, what he wanted and then when he hit it it's like yeah that's that great perfect then we move on so it was i did a combination of things like that um that's where probably it was why it was canceled <laughs> with it with could, a, with a director pounding and having could, could well days. be yeah i mean yeah and, and, and these were these were some that. really gifted artists too that yeah. i uh absolutely adored working with they were absolutely amazing and and i have i have I, I, it's uh, contrary to you animation was one of my favorite things to do because i just thought everyone was so amazingly talented and especially you know i don't know if you were one of the voice artists that would you, you know was capable of doing several of the characters I never was I always just did my you know teenage boy you know voice that was it but then watching other people like Frank Walker and you know some other amazing people that just they would play two to three different characters off of themselves I was always amazed by that so I love voiceover I respect voiceover artists so much and I think anyone who's broke into that industry at any level deserves a lot of a lot of credit because it's 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 demanding and it's tough and requires more talent than a lot of people probably um you know probably fully appreciate so yeah well frank welker played iceman in spider-man and his amazing friends <laughs> oh and <laughs> i love that there you there you go <laughs> yeah and and dan gildasan who was spider-man is still a really good friend of mine i just went over to his wife's house for a at the Low Lagoon, it was a, a ladies mermaid kind of while while Dan was out at the Philly Comic Con doing his thing, all the kitties came to to play at, at Kitty Gilbazan's <laughs> house. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I taught voiceover for like 20 years. And oh. I can do all mm. kinds of voices. And that's how I started out. And <laughs> it, but it was very strange to me to even get the concept really have a different voice <laughs> who would have thought but because i had i was with don don Schwartz commercial agency for a while doing commercials and he said oh we have a voiceover audition for you i says well what's that and this is a voiceover you know it's just a, a voiceover i said well what's that he says anytime you know you see something that's on the screen and there's a voice he says that's doing a voiceover i said okay i'll go 
So it was for uh, this tuna. And so I went and uh, the, the fellow was there and says, um, okay, this is what I'd like you to say. He says, I like tuna. And I said, okay, I like tuna. He says, okay, now do it in a different voice. I said, what do you mean a different voice? Well, I mean, do a different, different voice. I'm thinking, oh dear, what does that even mean? I said, I like tuna. He says, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and I said, I got to go take some classes. That <laughs> 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 was just awful. I, I didn't get that job. Um, but I've done other food um, commercials with the voice over, so they that me up for it. Well, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> well, but you know, I, when you do audio books, like I, that was another thing that I taught, and you're doing fiction audio books, you might have 50 different characters in one book, mm -hmm. and you're giving each one of them a different voice. So you say, well, how do you even do that? So once you have a general voice, you know, I, there's all kinds of different ways to change them either with your facial thing or whether it's down here or over here or using your whole facial thing. So there, there are ways that one can learn how to actually make different characters. It's a very schizophrenic, though, kind of undertaking. Yeah. What'd you say? I said it's a very schizophrenic. <laughs> well, I don't think that that's true. Okay, but I'm fine. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry we never had a chance to work together. That would have been an absolute blast. <laughs> I know. Well, we have to now. I think that would be really super fun. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I've got some projects going. We'll we'll see how they turn out. I'm doing some movies and I've got um, a pilot and I wrote this book. One of the books that I wrote was Ex Child Stars, Where Are They Now? Mm -hmm. And it primarily concentrated on the child stars stars of the 60s, 70s, the 80s, but it was just TV stars. So uh, doing a sequel to the child stars that were the film stars, like I, you know, fabulous <laughs> actors that didn't necessarily have a TV series, but had this wonderful, I loved Witch Mountain. I I thought that was such a wonderful, wonderful movie. And oh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, that <laughs> thank was you. terrific. It was really, you know, so well done and, and so engaging. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing a collaboration, hopefully. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I want to ask a couple of things before we let you go. I mean, uh, in 2002, they did a remake of the Family Affairs series. And recently, you did a spinoff, uh, Aunt Sissy, I saw. Um, what was it like revisiting the character again? Was it surreal for you? Well, what we're doing, yeah. And that, that first reboot was, well, abysmal, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> and they we were supposed to do 13, and they, they <laughs> shot maybe nine and they showed seven, but bye-bye <laughs> for that. Um, so we, we have a, a new concept that's doing with all the different platforms that are available to us now that we're not available to us then. Whereas we're doing eight episodes like at a time and it follows a whole family affair universe. And it's a, like a prequel sequel that is contained with each one of the episodes. And it starts out with Aunt Sissy and what happened with her. And then she goes on to narrate the next ep episodes, one which is about um, Mr. French, how he and Uncle Phil met. We have one about Mrs. Beasley, which is one of my favorites. And I don't know if you guys you know, remember the doll, but- Of course, oh, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. No, so Mrs. Course. Beasley has her own like eight episodes. <laughs> Uh, how often do you do fan conventions and uh, are you are you in one soon coming up that people can see you? I, I do a lot of uh, fan conventions. I did like about five already this year, Jen Stone Comic Con. And I also did a lot of Westerns in the uh, in the 50s <laughs> since I was 39, I know. Um, but Sheriff of Cochise and all that. So I just uh, did the uh, Western Legends Roundup in Kanab and, and Happy Trails. And uh, actually that I was supposed to do Cowboy Ways nowadays, but it, it was canceled. You know, this COVID thing is, ah, uh, give me a <laughs> So, uh, but I do do, and, and then I did Mid-Atlantic Comic Con. I did not, the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention, which I really, that's that's one of the best ones. I, I love that. Tony Dow and Jerry Mathers were there who are friends of mine. That was, you know, mm. 
uh, yeah, Tony and the bead, Wally and the bead. Um, so coming up, I, I have my new book that is just being released. Where is that book? It's not out yet because it's at the printer. And of course, <laughs> there is a shortage of paper because there's a shortage of lumber. So it won't be out for 20 more days. But this is the cover of it. See, isn't that cute? This is Family Affair um, Scrapbook. It's a little thin. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the cover. This is Family Affair Scrapbook. And I have things that I'm setting up in Los Angeles where I'll be appearing. So one is at the Rustic Theater in Idlewild, and that's in November. And then um, I'm doing a book signing at Just Fabulous in Palm Springs, and it is just fabulous. <laughs> and um, a reading at Oscars uh, and also a signing. And then December 11th, there is the Authors' Day at the Hollywood Museum. And there's 20 of us authors. Steve Wallace is going to be there and, and George Kiras and Allison Andro and, and me. My, my book, this one this is the latest one coming out. So. Well, Would you like to know where you can get my books? I, I was going to mention it, so but yeah, yes, absolutely, gonna, yes. But you you can plug it now before I mention it. But yes, I was going to mention to, your website. I hope you get out to Florida too. By the way, I hope you get some, some cons in Florida. So I was thinking about going to Clearwater, in, okay. near Clearwater Lake near Tampa. Is that that's it? Oh, Tampa, yeah. Tampa, Tampa area. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'd love to come to Florida. You can set it up. I'll give you ten percent. <laughs> Am I working right as soon as we get off? Okay, good. Good job. Well, I so, suggest yeah. fans go to your website, kathygarver.com, and they can yes. get autographed copies of your books there. That's right. Right. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I bought it on Kindle, so I'm not going to have to reach out and buy it on, uh, on the website too, to get an autograph. But, but Kathy, I, I mean, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you have other things to do, but thank you for taking the time out to join us today. Uh, we really appreciate that. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Same here. <laughs> I, I, I know I had like my stories run a little long, but hey. No, absolutely not. No, and uh, no, it was a thrill getting to talk to you. And you're welcome back anytime. And uh, you know, so again, this has been uh, Pop Culture Retro on behalf of Ike Eisenman, and I'm Jonathan Rosen. Thanks again to Kathy Garver. And remember, please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 